Well, good evening, people of God. We greet you in the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And it is so good to be in your presence tonight. Hey, I am, uh, I'm, uh, I'm very, <laughs> I'm very penitent that I, I shared last week with you and I listened to the, uh, to the Bible study from last week and I, I want to do something tonight just for my sake, just, just to make sure I'm being the best shepherd pastor teacher I can be. I, I think I did a pretty good job explaining the first five, six verses of chapter 12, but what I want to do tonight is just do kind of like a, a review or summation to make sure we understand exactly what the prophet is saying in this second burden, this second oracle that he's given. Because remember, it's about uh, an advent and an acceptance of Messiah who's coming. So I don't want us to miss this. I think it's important. Now, last week was good. Don't, 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 don't throw it away. But there's just, uh, I want to do some uh, Priscilla Aquila. There's just some Apollos, uh, more excellent stuff that I want to try to make sure that I'm doing. And, and, and I hope that you'll receive my offering tonight. So good evening, everybody. I know it's been a long day for so many of you. And uh, to just be here at 7 p.m. on Tuesday or whenever you take a moment to spend these 20, 25 minutes with me, I, I am so grateful and thankful for the for the process. So if you would open your Bibles to Zechariah chapter 12, it feels so good to be to say that here at the end of our, of our September. What is this, September 26th, like the last Tuesday of the month already? And uh, so fall is officially here. I believe the 22nd of September was the first day of fall. So, woo, we're off and going. So let's pray and we'll see what the Lord will say to us tonight. Bow your heads. Eternal God, thank you for sustaining us throughout this day, and thank you for breathing into us the insight that you would have us use so that we can understand your words so that we can live better. So strengthen us tonight. May our ears be available, our hearts be available, so that our feet may have direction after we've shared in the fellowship. We'll give you praise, glory, and honor for all we're about to hear. And thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Flowers fade, grass withers, but the word of our God endures forever. The king asked the prophet Jeremiah, is there a word from the Lord? And Jeremiah responded, there is. Let's see, where are we? Um, in the text, we spent our last week talking about how Israel, uh, last few weeks, how Israel is the chosen and can't do anything about being chosen, etc. And all of these similes of words of prophecy that we have. For instance, look at verse 1 as we just go through this quick review to make sure we really understand what these first five, six, seven verses of, uh, of chapter 12 are about. The burden of the word of the Lord for Israel says the Lord which stretched forth the heavens and laid the foundations of the earth and formed the spirit of man within him. So the burden of the word of the Lord for Israel, not against Israel, his for them, it's not against them. Now, conversely, the gospel is always to the true preacher of it. In other words, I'm the first student of the Bible fellowship I'm the first listener <laughs> of the sermon that I may attempt to preach on Sunday morning. I'm the first listener of the Bible study that we do, i.e., I heard something last week that I thought, wow, if I hear it that way, who has heard it that way? So you are always the first one to have to hold the burden of the oracle of God. But to those who receive it, it is a burden of blessing. It is a load of mercy. I like that. <laughs> and this comes from the Spurgeon, uh, Spurgeon's writing, the uh, Exposition Bible, uh, according to Spurgeon. He goes on to say that those who reject it, reject what? The gospel, the truth. Um, it would become a burdensome stone, crushing them to their eternal ruins, and that God, 
grants in his infinite mercy that none of us may belong to the last class. He does not want us crushed. He want us made better. Zechariah chapter 12, verse 2. Look at your Bibles. Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of trembling unto all the people around about, when they shall be in the siege both against Judah and against Jerusalem. Now, this is a promise. It's a promise of God's abounding mercy to his chosen people here. So when he comes to their aid, they shall be a cup of trembling to their enemies. Now, the enemies will try to sway them, but they will find that they are drinking something like a cup of poison, which will cause their own death. Remember, the other commentator said, it'll roll back on them, it comes back on the thing they try to do to uh, Israel, Judah, it comes back on them. And oh, that the day may soon come when God, says Spurgeon, would remember his ancient people, the Jews, and bring them back to their own land, as he certainly will do in the fulfillment of time. And when he has done it, then it shall come to pass that all who fight against them shall find his people to be a cup of trembling to them. And this is another promise that God is making to Israel, not against them. This promise, which is to be literally fulfilled to God's chosen people, the seed of Abraham, is also spiritually promised to those of us who are believers. And I hope I made that plain last time I tried to explain verse 2. Christians, not just Jews, but Christians, you also, the children of Abraham, right? Christians, our enemies cannot really hurt us any further than God will allow. Remember Job's uh, suffering and Satan's request? God was the one who instigated, for lack of a better word, that's figurative, that's not literal. Says, have you considered my servant Job, Satan? Satan says, sure have, yeah, see him every day. Want to get to him, but I can't because you always keeping him close to you. I tell you what, move back a little bit, let me at him, and I'll make him curse you to your face. God says, have at him. God, listen to that. Go on, touch everything but his soul. How often have we as Christians experienced hurt to the measure that God says we can take it? Okay, if they, meaning Israel, would drink up as men drink a cup of wine, their enemies, then you would be a cup of trembling to them. They would find that they had taken in more than they wanted. And all the persecutors of the church of God in smiting this stone have themselves been broken on it. Remember, you gotta be careful that stone you push because it has the proclivity to roll back on you. They have found that they have undertaken a task. Who? The enemies of God's people, whether Jews or Christians. They have taken on a task which has ended in their own destruction. Woe unto the man who fights against the church of the living God. Spurgeon says, victory must always come to the Lord's pit people, for greater is he who is in them than he that is against them. Zechariah 12, verse 3. Are you with me? Doing good, huh? <laughs> okay, it reads, In that day will I make Jerusalem a burdensome stone for all people. All that burden them with it shall be cut in pieces, though all people of the earth be gathered together against it, meaning Israel. Now, this is true, literally, but it is also true spiritually. So as the church of God is to be a cup of trembling to his enemies, so is it also to be a burdensome stone. They do not like it. They cannot bear it. They would, if they could, get rid of the church, meaning Satan. I, uh, 
every time I talk about spiritual warfare, some interests today and all that kind of stuff, I always like to just make it simple. Y'all, <laughs> we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against powers, against principalities, against spiritual wickedness in high place. You got it? So as much as I say they and them and Spurgeon and others say they and them, always keep it simple, saint. We're not fighting them. We're really fighting him. And if it is a them, his Satan and his kingdom of fallen angels known as demons. Got it? So let's make sure we're fighting the right folk. Uh, and this they and them is always in context. And it's at this point that I get, that I always remind myself of the words of my good friend and co-laborer uh, almost 40 years ago, the pastor of the Goodwill Missionary Baptist Church, the Reverend Dr. Benjamin Levi Baldwin, who says that saints spend so much time using their ammunition to kill and to shoot and wound each other. And when Satan shows up, we're out of ammunition. They would if they could get rid of the church, but they cannot get rid of it. Satan can't do it. There it is, a stone cut out of the mountain without hands, which will grow until it is filled with the whole earth and breaks in pieces everything that opposes it. All of a sudden, I got happy when I was reading back through this, and all these years, Clayton Lee, I've been talking about, you know, he's, uh, He's, uh, he's, he's uh, De De Ezekiel's wheel in the middle of a wheel. Uh, he's a stone hewed out of the mountain. And all of a sudden, okay, got it. Got it. I got it. Got it. Stone hewed out of the mountain. I got it. That, that's the power of our God. And, and it's in the context of him being available to all that is under the banner of his. Those who set themselves against God, when you fight against the church, when you fight against the believer, it's as if you fight against God. All those who fight against God and against his Christ shall find themselves crushed by this mighty stone. All right? All right, verse 4, how are we doing? Doing okay. Zechariah 12, verse 4. Now, in that day, says the Lord, I will smite every horse with astonishment and his rider with madness. What is Zechariah saying? Well, here it is. Spurgeon says, the chief strength of Jerusalem's enemies lie in horses and chariots. But God bids his people not to fear them, for he knows how to overcome all powers, whether it be the power of Cavalries or the power of infantry. Remember that word God gives us, some trust in horses, some trust in chariots, but we will trust in our God. Isn't it something? Tab, make sure. Uh, Facebook, Bible said fellowship, make sure you're trusting in somebody who can. All right? God knows how to smite every horse with astonishment and every rider with madness. For as the mountains are round about Jerusalem, so the Lord is round about his people from henceforth even forever. And he can protect them against the most powerful foes that may assail them. Their enemies, Spurgeon goes on to say, as I conclude verse four, their enemies shall not be able to see them. But God will see them, and he will deliver his people and overthrow all their adversaries. Now, let's go back, and you just put your little name up in there with R.L. Manaway, all right? Our enemies shall not be able to see us. If you want to put your name there, I read it like this. Robert's enemies will not be able to see him, but God will see them, and... God will deliver Robert and overthrow all his adversaries. Now, that's just good. Go on and take your lap. Go on. I'll wait till you get back. Was that music on Jeopardy? 
do 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 and the governors of Judah shall say in their hearts, The inhabitants of Jerusalem shall be my strength in the Lord of hosts their God. In that day I will make the governors of Judah like a heath of fire among the wood and like a torch of fire in a shaft. And they shall devour all the people round about on the right hand and on the left hand. And Jerusalem shall be inhabited again in her own place, even in Jerusalem. Now, that's just good stuff, isn't it? All right. So what does it mean? Well, Spurgeon says that the literal prophecy is that the seed, S-E-E-D, of Israel shall go back to their own land and shall prevail over their adversaries. But the spiritual meaning is this. It is that the church, the believers in time, shall have great power among the people of the earth. Wow, that is good, huh? So literally Israel is going to come back out of Babylon, going to come back and resettle the land she's in. And even today, as small as she is again, about the size of the state of New Jersey, the little country, little nation of Israel, is considered by some to be one of the most powerful nations on the planet of the earth. Isn't that something? Let me just, just hope, I have, hope I haven't uh, made too many errors on it. So, uh, powerful, just, just blessed by God. And nobody can do anything about it. And uh, the spiritual meaning again is that the church should have great power among the people of the earth. They shall have fire put on them. That's a phrase. I, I like that. And uh, it says the fire of the Holy Ghost. And they shall be like a lightning firebrand among the woods or a flaming torch in a shaft of corn, staff of corn rather. And you would know soon the sheath would be burned up. So if God has put... Mm, Within us, the fire from heaven, which is the Holy Spirit and anointing, then we will be sure to burn, and those with whom we live will soon feel the flame. Was it yesterday, day before yesterday, I was reading a devotion. I don't know if it was from Dr. Stanley. I don't know if it was from uh, Greg Laurie, but the reference was to Matthew chapter 5, I believe, you are the Lord, light of the world, a city that sit on the hill should not be hid. And this is how, how light is so powerful that people don't run to the light because our deeds are so dark, so light exposes us. What am I saying? If we are truly spirit-filled believers, we need to stop thinking it's so strange, please hear me, that it's hard for worldliness or people to be around us. Righteousness, holiness, and light has a way of exposing unrighteousness and unholiness and worldliness. And I think sometimes as believers, we spend too much time complaining about what we're going through because we're the only believer at that job. We're the only family that live in the housing complex. God knows how to strategically place lights on candlesticks so they can give light to the whole house. You are the salt of the earth, child of God. You are the light of the world. One more time. If God has put a fire in us, if the spirit of God lives in us, then we burn or we should be burning. 
And those who live close in our proximity ought to feel the flame. I wrestle with this, and, and I do. I, I just get my own deliverance. I struggle sometimes not wanting to believe that ain't hot enough. I struggle with the fact that unbelievers and sinners might be too comfortable around me. I know, I got it, I got it. Just listen to me, child of God. Paul says, to the Jew I became Jew, to the Greek I became this, to this I became this, to that I became that. Yea, I became all things to all men that by all means I might win some. Jesus was so, I don't even use the word accepted, but he had a rapport among sinners and publicans and tax collectors until it was the religious group of Pharisees and Sadducees that called him a friend to sinners. I hope I'm helping somebody. That's the context I want to be in. I want to be known as a Christian, Christian. Got it? But I don't want people not to be affected by the Christ in me to cause them not to feel the flame that should be burning in me. Got it? And at the same time, I don't want to become arrogant and snobbish and standoffish as to miss the opportunity to let my light shine. So that men may see my good works and glorify the Father which is in heaven. You know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop right here. I think this is a good place to stop. Um, can you see now why I wanted to go back and just make sure we understood verses 1 through uh, 4? And we actually got to uh, verses 5 and 6. So when we come back next month in October, God willing, we'll try to start here and see what else we can get done out of Zechariah Smile, chapter 12, y'all. We're moving on. May the Lord bless thee and keep thee. May the Lord let his face shine upon ye. Be gracious unto you. May our Lord's countenance always be upon you and you experience the Lord's peace. Until we meet again, amen, good night, and shalom.